We say young people are the future leaders of tomorrow. But when will this tomorrow come? If every time we go to the polls, we keep voting in the same old faces. New school politics means we have new voices, fresh faces, thanks to hashtag not too young to run. On today's episode of Political Politica, we delve into political issues affecting young people and speak to a new kind of politician, a model politician as he calls himself. My name is Isabella Akinshaye and the show starts now. Political Politica with Isabella Akinshaye. Today on Political Politica, we look at new school politics, and to do justice to that is a new school politician. He is an architect, activist, public policy specialist, and politician. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Nottingham, a master's degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and a second master's degree in research and public policy from the University of Lagos. GRV, as he's popularly called, is a firm believer in equity, social welfare, and justice. He contested for the chairmanship of Ikeja local government in 2017 under the umbrella of Kowa Party. He sits on the board of Al Huda Construction Nigeria and the Delta International Commercial City Limited. He's also the founder of Spatial Tectonics. He's very vocal against the introduction of GMOs in Nigeria and has been on the forefront of the many anti-GMO campaigns. He's currently seeking to represent Lagos West Senatorial District under the umbrella of the People's Democratic Party. Badebo, welcome to Political Politica. Good to be here. Thank you. When I think about the Senate, mm. I think about old men, people mm -hmm. who have been governors maybe twice, and this is their retirement plan. Yeah. They're in their 70s, you yeah. know, they're very old. And I see you, and yeah. you're running for Senate. You're yeah. 35. Exactly. So this new school politics, what is it really about? Well, we want to try and change the narrative. I think it's important that we change the idea that the Senate is a place people go to retire. It's very important that people with fresh ideas that can actually change this country go into the Senate and go into the House of Rep. I mean, participate in politics in general. But we need to get away from the idea that you need to have been a former governor to go and retire in the Senate or you need to be a certain age to go to the Senate. The Senate is supposed to be a, a part of the government where the ideas and policies that can be negotiated by the entirety of the assembly can come together and say, okay, let's fashion a way forward. And I think more than anything, six, seven million people are under the age of 35. They need representation there as well. So we associate a younger age yeah. when it comes to new school politics. Yeah. But how will this really deliver the dividends of democracy? I think that new, fresh ideas are more in tune with the times, right? We cannot continue doing things the way we've been doing it, expecting and hoping that something different is going to come out of it. We live in a digital age now. There are a lot of new ideas, a lot of fresh ideas on how we can move forward from things in education to healthcare to even sustainability and the energy sector. And we need new thinking. And that's what politics is supposed to be about, where as every generation becomes the, um, the, the determining demographic, they have a say in the people that are leading them and they have a same kind of policies and ideas that are being pushed forward by their leadership. So I hear you, new ideas, fresh ideas, but yes. the voter, are these new voters? They're the same old voters who are used to playing politics as usual. How will they really key into this new school politics? I, I will not say, I will not agree with that, that the voter is the same old voter. There are so many people that have turned 18 in the last two years and they've all registered and this, these are people of the social media generation, right? The politicians majorly are kind of more of the same of the same, but the voters, the demographic is changing. 
Now, the question and task that every politician has is, how do you channel your um, visibility to these people and how do they respond to you and how can you get them bothered enough to turn out on election day? Because they are asking for a new kind of interaction. They're asking for a new kind of dynamic. They are not the easiest ones to buy, you know. They want something new. These are people that are coming to the job market and they know that employment is at an all-time high. Um, what are you going to do? These are people that are looking to solve their problems themselves using so many new um, avenues from the social media to just entrepreneurship and new technologies. So we need to get, I also believe that we need to change demographic, the voting demographic for, to people that will start asking questions, start holding their politicians and representatives accountable. And that's how this country will move forward. But what about the, the block of voters, the market men, the market women, the people who will actually go to the polling stations, not the Twitter activists? Yes. Are they also keyed into this new school politics? I will not say they are keyed into it just yet. I, and even this new school politics, we also have to be a bit careful with it because politics is for everybody. It's not just for the young 18-year-olds. It's also for the older market women, the older gentlemen, you know, the people at the grassroots, the elite. A politician is supposed to represent them all. We just need to interact with them, speak the language that they know, affect their lives as much as you can, and make sure that you can make, take your message to them in a way they can understand. And you'll be surprised, everybody wants fresh ideas. Everybody wants a breath of fresh air in their jam pot. So let's talk about this block of young voters. Yes. The ones that are on Twitter, the ones that are saying we want to hear from our leaders, the people yeah. who want to represent us. You know, some weeks ago, we saw the two major presidential candidates yes. come up and they are old. They're mm. in their 70s. And there was this thing going on on Twitter that you're the same people who say, hashtag not too young to run. Mm. But now you're all re re rejoicing, hashtag articulate, there's Buhari. So really and truly, like, are these people really ready to put their money where their mouth is? I don't think we should limit their reaction based on the presidential candidates. It takes a lot to be able to become president of this country. This country is very complex. That six different states, different people, different tribes, different issues. It, it takes so much, so much. Nigeria is not a complicated, it's, Nigeria is a very complicated amalgam. Do you understand? I think the Not Too Young to Run bill did a lot for youth. I think it did. You have a lot of youth representation or youth coming out for assembly, places in assembly, house of rep, and look at me, Senate. And that emotion, you heard a lot of people carrying it in the political parties, not too young to run, not too young to run. And it made way for a lot of people. In fact, in PDP, the house of rep um, nomination ticket was reduced by one million. It reduced from, I think, 2.5 to 1.5. and. In the document, it expressly said to take into account the not too young to run bill. There is more to our politics than the president or even the governor. Your House of Assembly member, your House of Rep representative, your senator, these are very, very important. Even your councillor, your local government chairman, these are very important roles that we also need to pay a lot of attention to. But if these young people actually come out, they say, okay, I'm submitting myself to run for public office, yeah. House of Rep, yeah. Assembly, and they don't have the money, will they really be able to do this new school? Or do they have to borrow from the old school of politics, which is associated with big spending, money politics? The reason why our politics is so expensive, generally, is because of the level of poverty. We copy systems, and we don't do what it takes to actually sustain those systems. So for instance, in England and America, where we look to them for their democracy, you see that they're welfare nets. So that the person does not need to talk to a politician to collect 1,000 naira. He can collect money from the government while he's unemployed, unemployment benefits, right? You have credits, 
You have banks that actually give you loans. You go to school or you come out as an apprentice, you can get a loan to buy a house. You can get a loan to buy a car. You know, so these things allow for democracy to thrive in the true sense of it. But there is no such thing here. So you find that a politician almost becomes like a social welfare net. There is somebody in Alimosho um, D2 that got into an accident and she was, he or she will send you a text that I'm in the hospital. She really wants to represent me. Help me, right? I, I can tell you how many of those kind of messages I get. You don't even know which one is real, which one is fraudulent. But that's the point. Because of the extent of poverty in this country, people look to the politician, try and milk him or her as much as they can in the idea, with the idea that when they go, they are not going to come back and they are just going to go and get money for themselves. So it becomes very transactional. So and that was just explaining the problem that we have. I also feel that if you want to be a leader, you need to be resourceful. You need to be able to be resourceful enough to solve problems. And being resourceful also ties into being able to raise money. You might not be able to raise as much money as people that are stealing money or have their hands directly tied into the treasury, but you can raise enough that you balance with your time, your network of influencers, your network of friends, that you can gather and run a successful campaign. But won't you say that some of these young people are the same people who will say, you're inexperienced, what do you want to go and do there? Go and first face something, you know, go and mm. start a family first, go and run something, an, an organization, before yeah. you think you can lead us. So yeah. the young people are saying, we want more young people there, but deep down they're like, Let's not give them a chance. Uh, you are right to a certain extent, but you know, there's so many different type of people. I, I remember somebody tweeted that Gladiburo's viral is going to go into descending by God's grace and is going to bring such a breath of fresh air and new life. And then a young person tweeted on that quote and said, how can he go from local government chairman to Senate? This is ridiculous. And someone came on that and said, the experience you are talking about, what has he led Nigeria to? It's not just about experience. We live in a very mediocre country and we need to tell ourselves the truth. We discovered oil at the same time that they did in the Emirates. But we are nowhere close. There are no 20-year plans that we can see people feasibly, feasibly walking towards. The healthcare system is a mess. Today now, you're already planning for how you send your children abroad even before you've had those kids. It, it just seems that we are constantly nose diving healthcare, education, quality of life, employment, labor figures, they're all saying that. So this experience that people are talking about, what is it experience in? Mediocrity? So it's time for fresh ideas to come into the Senate. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And people will always have different things to say. I think we just need to focus our energies on the ones that are thinking like us that want the same things we want and just focus and push that way. Because if you stop to throw a stone at every dog that backs your way, you never get to where you're going. Thank you very much. And that's where we conclude on our topic of the day segment. But when Political Political returns, we will be looking at politics and more where Gbadebo shares his journey into the political world. Political Politica with Isabella Akinshe. You're still tuned in to Political Politica with me, your host, Isabella Akinshe. Before the break, we talked about new school politics. By the way, it's now time for our politics and more segment. Okay. Tell us, how did this whole political journey start for you? Um, in summary, it started from activism. I feel that I'm not a person that can just complain about things and carry on with my day. Um, with the introduction of genetic modified foods into Nigeria, I stood up against that, tried to educate as many people as I could, um, debated with former Minister of Agriculture, and the summation was being part of a team that led a 2,000-man march on the Senate. And in that whole process and having to interface with government officials, I felt that a lot of people we have in office don't have empathy. They don't really put the people first. And I wanted to be that different politician. And in doing that, I said, let me start locally. So I ran for chairman of Ikeja local government, um, highlighting the ills to my constituents and working in a very 
door-to-door -door kind of grassroots campaign. We came third. I ran on that core party then, and we built structures to ensure that we could protect our votes and all of that. So it was a very good experience to understand how one can put mechanisms and machineries for a campaign and politics together. Uh, subsequently after that, I joined PDP and have been very active in my local government and also in the senatorial district that I'm running for. And today, I thank God to God be the glory. I'm the candidate for PDP for Lagos West Senatorial District, the biggest senatorial district in Nigeria. So how was that like contesting a primaries? I mean, you're coming from a different political party, Koa. Mm -hmm. You were unsuccessful in your mm -hmm. bid for local government mm -hmm. chairman. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying, give me the ticket for Senate. And let's not forget, like, Lagos generally is mm -hmm. an APC state. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Lagos West is 10 local governments. Currently, PDP controls four of those local governments. The entire Badagi division generally is an opposition division. And then you have the Kaja division. Um, in terms of how one was able to run and ask for the ticket, it's about interaction, about selling yourself. It's about meeting the leaders, the respective leaders in these different local governments. It's about selling yourself, selling your ideas. And you'll be very surprised that a lot of people and a lot of leaders are looking for young, fresh faces to carry this flag. Give kudos to the Lagos PDP4 because it's the House of Rep for Oshudi Solo that pushed the not too young to run bill. And the Oshudi Solo local government is also part of Lagos West. So it's no accident that we are not hypocrites. If you are pushing not too young to run bill and a young man is coming out from that same central district and you give him the chance, you see that it's not just talk. There's also a lot of action there. Okay, so this second time around, yes. what political mistakes did you make the first time around that you'll be correcting and how? I feel that the first time I ran, I was very idealistic. I did not really take into consideration the effect of the level of poverty that we have that currently envelopes most people that live in Lagos. You know, Lagos is more than Lekki and Ikeja and the main roads. In the wards, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of suffering. But let us also take in consideration that, you know, for local government election, people don't really participate in it. A lot more people feel they have something at stake when they want to vote for president or vote for governor. So I'm sure that the turnout is going to be a lot more. And also, working with a party with a strong structure will also make sure that a lot of things can be done positively this time around, so. You spoke about party structures in yeah. the PDP, yeah. and they welcomed you, and yeah. it's a place for hashtag not too young to run. Exactly. But what is it about the PDP? Is it the ideologies? Is it a godfather? What mm. else drove you to joining the PDP? When I ran for local government chairman, it was because I did not like what was happening in the wards in Ikeja. And it's not PDP that's responsible for that. They don't, they've not produced any Ikeja local government chairman. They've not produced any governor that can say, OK, this PDP governor was holding back funds meant for the local government, right? And in that whole experience, I did not like the quality of behavior that I saw in that whole experience. At the local level, the PDP in Lagos, for me, is a party that always tries to attract very credible people. It also tries to attract indigents. It makes room for indigents. It also makes room for non-indigents as well. And you see the kind of candidates that even contest for primaries. These are highly educated, very smart, very articulate people that have um, a lot to offer Lagos. So I was drawn to PDP, and I also believe that um, this next election is going to be one that's going to be determined by capacity and competence, not just emotion. Capacity and competence. But what about the role of a godfather or godmother? Yeah. A person that we call a godfather is really an authority in a particular place. So for instance, if you lived in Ikeja and you helped people 
with their hostel bills, school fees. If people had a fight, they'll come to you and you give them your time, they listen. If there's a fight somewhere, you you would um, mobilize people to go and try and solve that problem. And you are doing that for years, not just during election time, you are doing that for years. You constitute yourself to be an authority. It means that when you tell people that you, they should vote for somebody, they will listen because you have shown that you have empathy, you have shown that you care about them. Now, these are the same, this person that has done this will now be called a godfather because if I want to run and I need to get the ears of the people. I will come and meet you for your advice. I will come and meet you for your support. Now, when you now say you like Badibo, you are now a godfather. But you don't just become a godfather from nothing, right? These are people that have constituted and take responsibility for constituents. So do you have any godfathers? I will not say I have godfathers. I have leaders. To run for Lagos West, there are 10 local governments. There are leaders in each of these local governments that have made a difference in the lives of people there, right? And these leaders are people that are active in politics, whether it's political season or not political season. They are constantly active. They are constantly making a difference. And if you want to be sold to people, having them support you is a very major part of the whole political process. It's like when, I mean, people can know you very well in the Keja, but when you go to a Jiro, me or Jo, there's somebody that has to stand for you and say, this young man is a good man, he's a vibrant man, he'll do well for us, he'll be a good representative. So are you under any obligation to do something for these people when you get in, I, if you get in? By God's grace, when I get in. Politics and politicking is a game, especially in Nigeria, is a game of interest. Governance, for me, is a game of empathy, as representation should also be of empathy. Now, anybody that's involved in politics has an aspiration. Whether it's just that they need somebody that, if anything goes wrong, they can call the person, that person can give them a helping hand, or can make sure that things go slightly smoother for them. You see what happened in Lagos with the PSPs and the party, right? The removal of those PSPs and the bringing of Visionscape removed a lot of the staff strength of the PSPs who are all party APC members, right? So there must be a benefit to being part of the association because that's what a party is. It's an association and that association has interest. The idea of the politician is try and balance the interest of the people and the association and ensure that the people always come first and you can then push the nation forward. Okay, so my final question will be, like you said, when you get in, or yes. if you get yes. in. So what will your political career look like in the next 10 years? Oh, next 10 years. I think let's first start with the four. I aim to be the model senator. I want to create the new prototype of what a senator should be. And that is based on the interaction with the constituents, the projects that we do, and how we get consensus, how we build consensus to ensure that everybody has a stake in that project. The idea that one is not just sitting there in Abuja, one is here with his people, because that is very important to a lot of people. Also trying to open up the um, central district to investments, to private sector funding, to anchor Bora schemes with the CBN to ensure that all the tradesmen can have access to credit this is also very important to me. And then also, for me, I want education is something I'm very passionate about. And the idea that we can co change the consumption mentality to, pro to a production mentality. Our schools and our education system teaches us that we go to school to get a salary and get a job so we can buy a house and buy this and buy that. It's not so much about producing, production. How are things made? This experiment you're learning in class, what are the applications for it? How can you use it in your immediate environment? And that is something that I'll be keen to do as, as consistency projects, after school programs for students. And another thing that I want to look at is how we can make an impact on the quality of life in Lagos. For instance, you have all these tankers that are on the streets in the Badagri Axis, at Jeremy, even at Mu, bad traffic if you're coming from Badagri and that entire axis. 
And this is because we have too many containers and too many trailers coming through Lagos. We need to open up other ports. And that would be a consensus I'll be trying to get with my counterparts from the southeast and the south-south to try and get funding and appropriation to open those other ports in those parts of the country so that a lot more traffic can be directed there. It reduce the cost of goods. Also, you don't have trucks staying on the road for weeks. Before, it used to cost about 250,000 naira to move your truck from Tinkan to anywhere in Lagos. Now it's about 800,000. So it's also making life very hard for businessmen. Independent power projects also is very important, especially for well, Lagos. You're already going into our next segment, which yes. is the Project Lagos yes, segment. Yes, but yes. I like how you've given us a tip of the iceberg about okay. being this model yes. senator. Yes. So we'll go on a quick break now, but when we return, it's time for Project Lagos, where we'll find out what it really means to be a model senator and what a model senatorial district will actually look like. Do stay with us. You're still tuned in to Political Politica with me, your host, Isabella Akinshe. It's time for Project Lagos segment. So you already alluded to some of the things that you will be doing if you're voted in. But how will you rate Lagos West Senatorial District now? I think currently it's very poor. We have very poor representation. The entire Badagri division has been forgotten by this government. Lagos Badagri Expressway is full of so many potholes. If you're coming from Ali Mosho to go to Badagri, it can take you almost two and a half hours without any traffic on that road. And this is an international road, so it's terrible. Lagos West, being the biggest central district in Nigeria, needs more quality representation. It needs a representative that is using that platform to bring in as many private sector individuals, as many NGOs into this place to create primary health care centers that make sense, you know, data-driven um, medicine and things of that nature, especially with education as well. Well, why do you think you're the best man for the job? Because I care. I have a huge amount of empathy. My passion has always been to serve. I come from a family that has a long history of that. We complain too much in this country. We talk too much in this country. Let us get involved. And I truly believe that I have the skill set. I mean, I'm an architect. I have a master's in architecture from the best school in the world for architecture. When I said I wanted to go into politics, I went back to school, Unilag, and I got a master's in research and public policy, specifically to be able to allow one to legislate properly. The idea of forming policies that have um, significant consensus and carrying stakeholders along. And this is something I spent almost two and a half years pursuing and doing so successfully. So I believe more than anything, aside from the education, aside from the exposure, the empathy, being a people's person, not wanting to run away from your constituents. You know, people, they become, they get in position and then they just run away and live so far away from people. And I also believe that if one can actually execute this and be the prototype, a new prototype of senator, where you're not a former governor, you're not going to retire. Instead, you are here to try and make the most of what it can be and actually actively affect your constituents. And I think I'm also going to open the door for a lot of young people to come in. And that's what we need, fresh faces and fresh ideas. Okay, so you said before that you're not going to be a senator that just stays in Abuja yeah. and forgets its constituents. Yeah. So how much will you do in terms of engaging people after you get into power? What I want to do is I want people and the constituents to feel that they truly have a representative. They have somebody that is a phone call away or a ward meeting away or a town hall away and somebody that has these town halls regularly. And I feel that you can achieve this now more than ever because of the use of technology. We have our own campaign website, we have our manifestos that you have access to. But when we now get into position, we're going to have our website that lets you keep track of the voting patterns. We also have regular town hall meetings. We can use technology to bridge the gap. Even if you are sitting in your office in Abuja, there's no reason why there cannot be a screen and a projector so you can be part of ward meetings or it can be part of town hall meetings. Also to have 
enough people that are working as almost your ambassadors, that are interacting with people and giving you feedback regularly. And another important thing that we need to do in Lagos West is collect data. We have no data. There is nowhere that you can go to see how many people got malaria the last year, or what's the level of unemployment, what kind of skill sets do people have, so that you can now tailor your energies towards this and know the kind of businesses, NGOs that you need to attract into particular regions in that particular central district. Because they are very varied. But you need data to make intelligent use of resources that you have. And you don't see that happening. So that's going to be a major task, collecting data across all the local governments, the businesses in those areas. What do they need? What kind of skill sets do people have here? What kind of skill sets can we train people to have? China is what it is today because it has a huge population that are highly skilled. No matter how much you don't like China or made in China electronics, Apple cannot go anywhere else to make those electronics because there's there, there are people there that have been trained so well that it now attracts the companies to come there. And these are the kind of things we can do in Lagos West. So companies will say, you know what, the best place we should go to is Lagos West because they have the skilled labor. And you can only do that with data. So that's going to be a major part of our um, government. So you've talked about a model senatorial district. You've talked yes. about a model senator, which yes. ties into our topic of the day on new school politics. But how do you see this model senatorial district fitting into a model Lagos? Well, it's half of Lagos, right? So it's not exactly fitting into a model Lagos. It's half of Lagos. It's the largest senatorial district in Nigeria. And it has a huge population. We're looking at about 11 million people. I think it just needs to fit into itself <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and be a central district that works and have a representative that's working and fighting to ensure the federal government does what is right with the infrastructure. I think we just need to get it right, make sure the Badagri division is no longer forgotten by the Lagos government and ensure that the people of Lagos West actually have good governance. So we're looking at Lagos in general yes. now. So maybe the question will be, what will your ideal model Lagos mm. be? So my ideal Lagos would be Lagos where we have better transportation networks. We've created systems where not everybody needs to use their car to go to work. A place where we've made sure that we use our influence as a state that's very wealthy and resourceful to actually work with other states to almost be like, have satellite Lagos all over the country so that we also limit migration coming in. Because no matter how well you are planning your city and no matter how much of structure you are building, if you cannot stem some of that migration, you are still just going to end up in the mess you're trying to avoid. And as long as Lagos does not take the role of captain of development, especially in the Southwest, then you still have all that migration coming in. So we need to do that. We also need to reach out to our brothers in the south and the southeast to ensure their ports become opened so that we can reduce the kind of port traffic that we have affecting our roads, affecting quality of life because of people in traffic, affecting businesses and things like that. I also want a Lagos for that's inclusive. We have fascinating history, Lagos State. Lagos State has always almost been apart from the country. It was one of the last ones to come and become part of the union. And Lagos State has been home to intellectuals, political giants. So the idea that for almost 20 years we've been tolerating one person just determining all the factors in is very anti-Lagos. A Lagos that has a very good quality of life and not sitting down in two hours traffic every day in the morning, three hours traffic coming back home. A Lagos that has huge employment rates and a Lagos that actually creates some of the most highly skilled labor force in Africa and Lagos are like. This new Lagos, it sounds like a China of some sort. So mm. people are coming here to manufacture, people mm. are coming here for the tourism, people are coming here to learn and yeah. things work and we're not spending so many hours in, in traffic. traffic. Exactly. Okay. So that's where we close our Project Lagos segment. But when we return, we switch things up on a very lighter note on our Quick Fire segment. You don't want to miss that. 
Welcome back to Political Politica with me, your host, Isabella Akinshe. Now it's time for the fun part, our quick fire segment. Okay. Buddy, are you ready? I believe I am, yes. Number one, the first female governor will emerge in the next elections. True or false? False. Number two, the party that will dominate in 2019 is? PDP. Number three, young people have what it takes to be leaders because? They have fresh ideas and they're innovative and part of the current stream. Number four, the funniest thing I've read about myself online. This elite person that has no business in politics. Number five, the candidate I am most afraid of. I'm not afraid of anybody. And number six, Nigerians will vote with their stomach or their brains. Both. Number seven, if not you, who? Yeah, you said if not me now. Yeah. Yeah, so the best man is out of the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get for the less qualified person. Well, you said it. I didn't. <laughs> and it's almost a wrap on today's episode of Political Politica with me, your host, Isabella Akinshe. It's time for final words. So imagine you have your last breath. Mm. You say, you take that deep breath, and you have the audience of 200 million Nigerians, in fact, the whole world, look into your camera mm. and deliver your final words. It's time that we stop complaining and get involved in politics. It's time we hold our leaders to a higher standard it's time we stop circling in mediocrity. It's time that we have representatives that fight and have empathy for the people that they represent. I'm standing to run for Lagos West because those are, those are the values I embody. And I hope that by this example, I'll create a generation of people that would lead by example and also be the model representative that this nation badly needs. Thank you, Badibo. Thank you for having me. And there you have it. Fresh faces, fresh ideas. A politics that's not just for the old, but for the young. And like we say on Political Politica, it's politics for everyone. I'm Isabella Akinshe, reminding you that politics is indeed for everyone. So play a part and stay woke.